We're still sinners. Christ died for us. Getting people to recognize that is a hard thing. And I know that because it was hard for me to recognize that. It was hard for me to come to terms with my own unrighteousness and my own iniquities and that I was part of the problem, not yet part of the solution. Like Paul, I'm glad that the Lord has made me part of the solution, that he's given me a place to work in his kingdom, that he's given me fine people to deal with and to have fun with and to work with. But I cannot get so high-minded that I think that I am doing this on my own. Because it is only by the grace of God that anything is accomplished. Amen. It is only by the grace of God that we have life and breath and anything for that matter. I'm reminded of the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that forbidden fruit... <coughs> They sewed together fig leaves to cover themselves and their nakedness because they recognized something, sin, for the first time. And yet they hid from God. <laughs> See, the clothing that we make, the excuses that we make, the righteousness that we create, doesn't cover anything. Just like those fig leaves didn't really cover them. And they hid from God. And it wasn't until afterward, after they came clean to God, finally, they blamed each other, frankly, and they inevitably received what condemnation was coming, but God did what? Gave them clothes. Gave them clothes appropriate to their needs. And then they could go out into the world. We need to recognize that the clothes that we make, the excuses that we make, the lies that we tell ourselves need to come into the light. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old Chris is gone. It doesn't matter how good he was, how righteous he thought he was, he wasn't enough. He wasn't sufficiently righteous, sufficiently holy, and it doesn't matter otherwise. All that matters is that he was not enough to go to heaven. It doesn't matter how close he thought he was, because he was worlds away. But in Christ, we can be a new creation. Sometimes we put our works and this is oftentimes what the church can struggle with. Thinking that the works that they perform and the amount of things that they do for the body of Christ suddenly turns the tables and allows them to have some pet unrighteousness or some pet sin. Something that they hold back when they don't realize that they are supposed to be workers in the kingdom. In Revelation chapter 3, in verse 16, he says... So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Then he says, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Why is the Lord spewing these people out of his mouth? Why is he vomiting them out of his mouth? And you say, well, because they're lukewarm, but why are they lukewarm? It tells you right there. You're lukewarm because you don't recognize your issues. You don't recognize your sins. You don't recognize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and left to our own devices. That describes us. Before Christ, we were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. These Laodiceans were not horrible people. They weren't the worst of the worst. But without Christ, that didn't matter because they were lost in their sins. And so he counsels them to buy from him gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anointing your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You want to see? Receive the vision of God through his word. You want to be clothed? Be clothed in the righteous works of God and in faith in Christ. There's a reason that the whole armor of God is spiritual. There's not a physical robe that you wear. It's not a specific color and bathed in a specific thing. It's a symbolic thing. It's a spiritual thing that the Lord provides you, that he washed in his own blood. It's white because it was washed in blood. That doesn't make any sense to us. It's white because it was washed in his blood. And then in verse 5 there in chapter 3, he says, He who overcomes shall be clothed with white garments, and I will... Not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The goods that the good works that we can do 
are beneficial to the kingdom, but they don't earn us salvation. They don't make us more or less likely to go to heaven. They are a byproduct of who we become. They are a part of who we become. And so there's a challenge for us to not think too highly of ourselves, to try to muscle our way into heaven. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I love this song as a kid. Oh, you can't get to heaven? Yeah. Oh, you can't get to heaven on roller skates uh, because you roll right by those curly gates? Did you know there's only four verses to that originally? When I was a kid, we had 20. (laughs) Easy. Easy. We had 20 of them. You know why? Because it was so catchy. You've just come up with more things that you could say, and you just have to rhyme them. I tried this afternoon. It is not that easy. Rhyming, rhyme songs, not as easy as when I was a kid. Of course, I probably had lower standards when I was a kid. But the whole idea of that is that these physical things don't get you into heaven. But we could write that about anything, couldn't we? Our bank accounts. I don't know how you're going to rhyme that, but that's your business, not mine. Your, your family. Your connections, networking connections that aren't included in Jesus. You can't pay your way into heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 18, he says that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold that we received by traditions to aimless conduct. It's lessons from our fathers, he argues. But we are sanctified and we are cleansed by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church began the sale of indulgences. They believed in purgatory, and I I suspect a lot more people believe in purgatory than they would let on. If you're not quite good enough, you just get punished a little bit, and then you get to go to heaven. There's a lot of people I think are holding out for that. Even, I worry, some in the church. Well, the sale of indulgences was the idea that some people, because their faith at the time was works-based, That some individuals, like the saints and the apostles, they did more than was necessary to get into heaven. Now, there's a problem already. But what happens is everything that's surplus to what they needed to get into heaven is banked. And you can access that bank, isn't it amazing? Just by giving us some money. In fact, it was so popular that one individual that collected the sale of indulgences, he created a jingle. I love his jingle. When the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. The idea was that you could pay so that your, your, dis, or your ancestor, your family member who you love and is in purgatory according to you and according to the teachings of the church at the time, that you can get them out of purgatory simply by paying some money. Or you can do some ungodly thing if you pay money now or later, depending on when it happens, that you can earn some of those good works from the bank. Do you know how profitable that was? It paid for the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. That's like a that's like an incredible building, one of the best, the nicest structures in the area. It paid exclusively from the sale of indulgences. That's how much, that's how tempting it is to try to pay your way into heaven. That it paid for St. Peter's Basilica. Excuse the time. And that should tell us something about ourselves, that we are not so far away from thinking that putting money in the collection plate equals salvation. And there are people that do that. They think that just as long as I send my check in, just as long as I'm there to put it in the collection plate, and they give a certain amount, then everything is fine. And yet, it is the heart that God desires. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 5, 6, and 7. That it's the heart of the individual, the heart desiring to give, that God is truly after, not the money in their pocket. And that's the short-sightedness that we sometimes have. Why Jesus? Why Jesus? Because obedience brings reward. In Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, notice in verse 12, those of you who hear me regularly will recognize this. This is one of my favorite verses. It's in the middle of a book that confuses a lot of people. If you remember that the book of Revelation was written to a group of people who were going through a lot, a lot of stuff. And they needed encouragement because that stuff wasn't going to end anytime soon. But it would end. It would end either in their death or it would end inevitably in the future when Rome was dealt with by God. And he would deal with them. 
In verse 12, he says, here is the patience of the saints. All the things that are going on, this is why the saints keep going. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works following them. Jesus thought it was so important to write to the seven churches in Asia and ultimately to the church at large. He thought it was so important that John share this message to remind them of why they keep going, why they continue, why Jesus, and this is as good an answer as any, because they shall rest from their labors and their work shall follow them who, blessed are they who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed are they who die in the Lord from now on, because in Christ are all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Why Jesus? Because outside of Christ there are no spiritual blessings. Sure, the rain will fall on the just and the unjust alike, that he'll sustain this earth as long as he does, and then one day it'll be destroyed. But if you want spiritual blessings, there is no place to go but Jesus. If you want an opportunity to be saved, there is no place but Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you tonight need to become part of the body of Christ, you need to put on Christ in baptism. You have come to the conclusion that Jesus is the, the Holy Son of God, the one who came and died according to the scriptures, the fulfillment of prophecy. He is the one whom you need to follow take direction from, to live for each and every day, and you are ready to repent of your sins and your life of wickedness, and you're ready to put on Christ, we can help you tonight. We can help you to be saved according to his teachings. You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to go to another man. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what your neighbor says. All that matters is what God has demanded, and obedience is within your grasp tonight. If we can help you make your life right with God, we pray that you would let it be known as together we stand and sing.